Thanks very much, everybody. Um, uh, I suppose, first off, um, my uh, presentation is quite practical in its content, really, and it's around using a H5 online video. So I was listening intently to people earlier on about where they store their videos and where they get their videos and how they create their videos and things like that, because uh, I suppose I'm piggybacking a little bit on that, given that I'm using videos that are already online uh, to create these interactive assessments with H5P. You can use your own videos. That's the first thing. And um, I suppose with H5P, you can use videos that you created yourselves. You can upload them as MP4s and you can add all the things that we're going to talk about today. But here it's really just, um, I know part of my practice when I'm teaching is to look to see what's there already. There's no point in reinventing the wheel if there's something out there that's really good, particularly on YouTube. Um, and, and it's a possible, again, uh, to use those depending on the licenses and so on. Then um, I would use those rather than going through the, the motions of creating something for the sake of creating it personally. So it's online and it's interactive. That's kind of what we're talking about. So first off, what is H5P? Um, you may remember back in the days where we had Flash as something that we used to, to create interactive activities. Uh, that went by the wayside and then we have uh, H5P to replace it, which is actually much more user friendly. It's HTML5 uh, a package. It is supported by the Mozilla Foundation and it was it originated out of MIT. So all good things originated out of uh, MIT. It is free and it's open source. And again, I'm mindful of kind of, you know, they, they, they the notion of subscription so it's free it's open source uh, and it can plug in to your content management system so we in the in, uh, tooth midlands and midwest we use moodle there might be other learning management systems uh, drupal is also supported wordpress i think is also supported but there is a web-based editor which means that you can actually go onto h5p.org and you can create um, interactions for your video uh, on the, the website. Um, it's a, a huge community, very active in terms of content creation and content sharing. And what I really like about it is the reusability. So for example, if I create something on our learning management system, I can actually upload it to uh, h5p.org and vice versa. So you can reuse it quite a bit. And that collaborative um, spirit is really really um, present, I suppose, in the community. So that's the website there, h5p.org. I would recommend if you're interested in have a look at the, the website. You can see in the little screenshot on the right hand side that those are the kind of content types that are available. It's not just interactive video, but that's the focus of today's session. So if you wanted to have a look, you can go to h5p.org to have a look at it. Okay? So moving on then, as I say, the focus today was on the online interactive video. Uh, and I just pulled a uh, Recently, I was doing um, a lecture on research methods, and I wanted to find something very succinct, very short about research questions and developing a research question. So you can see this one is about six minutes long. Um, it's on YouTube, available from the Laurier Library. Uh, and what was important for me then was, if you see down at the bottom, the license is Creative Commons. Okay, so I was going to be able to use it, um, and then I was going to I, add the interactions to it, knowing that they were okay with that. So. Um, what I did then was, I suppose I was thinking about it from a learning and teaching perspective, and I was thinking, okay, I don't just want to give this video to the students, I want them to be um, engaged with it, I want them to actively use it. Uh, and active learning is something I suppose when you think about all of the videos that are available, if we were to just put the videos up for students, then um, you, it could very quickly become overwhelming in the amount of uh, content that's there. So I wanted to, to actively engage with the uh, the video that I, I gave them, but I also wanted to, them to be able to go back to it, to be able to revise, review and so on. So that's that self-directed learning, really to kind of focus on their learning path and you'll see how customizable it is when you get, when we get into it. Um, a, I used it with first year graphic designs during COVID, uh, graphic design students during COVID as part of a team based learning approach to the module. Um, and I used it as a formative assessment tool so that when they came into the classroom, they had actually practiced what I wanted them to do. And when they came into the classroom as part of team based learning, they had an individual assessment, which they were much more ready for because they had used H5P within a video as their formative assessment tool. You can use this as a summative assessment tool because it actually actually um, sends a report back to the grades within the LMS. So you can use it as a summative assessment tool, but I've used it primarily as a formative tool and it works quite well, just in my opinion. So it's a three-step process. 
and you can see at the bottom of the screen that it's step one upload your video uh, as i say you can upload your own mp4 and you can also embed now um embedding videos works really well with youtube and i was delighted to hear earlier on you know that we talked about unlisted videos on youtube once you have the url for the video on youtube then you can use it it doesn't um, it doesn't work with all links to all platforms. So, for example, we have Screencast-O-Matic as a platform in Tus Midlands, and it doesn't really recognize, it doesn't actually recognize Screencast-O-Matic links. So I would use it an MP4 in that case. But YouTube works really well, and um, that's probably my go-to for when I'm using videos that I find online. Even my own videos, I upload them to a YouTube channel, I put them up as an unlisted, and it just makes life an awful lot easier. The second thing you do, the second step, is adding the interactions. So um, from that point of view, you can see the list of them there. They go from multiple choice to single choice, to true and false, to drag and drop, to hotspots and an image, um, branching and so on. There's lots and lots of things um, that you can add. And I suppose you have to think about really, what is it you want the students to take away from the video? So there's reflection on your part in terms of how you build these but then you can decide at the end to include a summary task and the beauty of the summary task is that you know if the students have completed the summary task they've watched the video till the end because oftentimes you'll see okay they'll fall off maybe after halfway through and so on but if you've got a summary task the students then need to um watch to the end okay so three-step process um, and as i say there are other um, options for customization. One of the things I think I, I really like is the um, the idea of the behavioral settings. So you can see, for example, you start the video at, um, particularly on YouTube, you'll know at the beginning of the, the videos is the ads, right? You have to sit through the ads to get to the video. So if you start the video at a particular time code, you can eliminate the ads at the beginning. So the students are in an academic environment straight away. The other thing I think is important maybe to mention is the prevent skipping forward. So you don't want the student to go, I'll go to that, interaction that interaction that interaction and home okay like stepping stones you want them to actually engage so you have to get them uh, into the video and that prevents skipping forward allows you to do that okay um in terms of the customized feedback you can see that on the left hand side of your screen you have within the interaction the opportunity to add feedback so here uh, for example is my text and then here you have a tip text and a little eye pops up to show uh, people that there is a tip and it gives them a little hint in terms of the, uh, the answers that they might need to um, consider uh, messages displayed again that's customizable feedback that you want to put in there and on the right hand side you have the overall feedback so you have a score range that you can adapt to suit yourselves and then feedback for that defined score range so you can customize the feedback to suit the, the group of students that you have and remember the reusability of the h5p um, interactive videos so you could have maybe one h5p video and use different interactions or different score ranges for different students or different levels there is adaptivity as well. So for example, if they get the answer correct, that's what I've done here. They've said great work. It looks like you've understood the elements of the section and then action on wrong. So what to do if it's right, what to do if it's wrong, and you can include more information in terms of time codes and so on. Okay. Um, I just wanted to show you two screenshots of what it looks like in Moodle in terms of the grader report. So again, on the left hand side, hopefully you can see it. These are the activities within the grader report. So attendance is one. It's listed as any other activity within Moodle. Um, and then generally I get a list of the students and their grades for the activity. And on the right hand side, then you can see the individual students um, progress, individual students uh, attempt at it and what they got right and what they got wrong. So they can see here, this was just an example, but got three out of three um, and in terms of each of the different um, questions you can see what their answer was and what the correct answer was as well so it's really useful from the point of view of the formative assessment certainly going back to Moodle and the grades and the students again have visibility of their grades within Moodle okay so what I'll do is and start instead of saying let's jump in I'm going to actually just copy this code if I can and uh, see if I can get it into the chat box for you because we mightn't have time to go through um, all of it and just see if I can put that in uh, very briefly. I just wanted to show you um, the interactions on the page. So uh, I'll pop it in the chat box after the session. You can have a look at it yourselves in your own time. But you can see here that there's my video and these are my interactions. Oops, let me get my uh, annotation out instead. These are my interactions. Data research question. Okay. That's multiple choice. Um, I go to this one. This is a single choice. 
And then you can see that I have uh, maybe the summary task at the end. I'll show you that one as well. There's mark the words, so you can mark the correct word. And this is my summary dialogue, or this is my summary task at the end. And I'll see if I can get it right. No, nope, I got it wrong. So you can see there that you have a couple of different options for um, interactions, and I'll put them into the um, I'll put them into the chat box afterwards. All right. So moving on then, just to the last couple of bits in terms of where I used it. I mentioned I used it with graphic design year one, and um, this is how I use it. So this was my Moodle page. You can see it, they had a H5P video. This was their um, pre or their come before they came to class, they watched the video and they used the um, interactions, they used the questions. And then they came in and they had a lot of activities to do within the class, uh, both in the context of the team-based learning um, process and also then in terms of their application exercises for what I wanted them to achieve. Um, and then those were the, the technologies I used. So it was Zoom, it was Moodle, it was the software relevant to the students, uh, Photoshop in this case, and H5P as well. Um, and I asked the students to tell me what they thought about it. These are the kind of things that they put up. So in terms of having the video before they came to class, now bear in mind this was COVID, the students didn't have any on-site classes. Um, they were first years, this was their experience of college and so on. So there were lots of things kind of, lots of things to take into account and to factor in um, as I was working with them. But these are the kinds of things I said. So I like them as a test, it makes them more interactive, refreshes your memory. But there were always the one or two who said, yeah, they were useful, but they weren't really necessary. I could have done without them as well. So, you know, we had the balanced argument there. We had the for and against definitely uh, in terms of what, what we were doing. But in the main, it quite, which was quite, I suppose, positive. Uh, and I certainly found that when they arrived into the class, having done the activities, they were much more comfortable with what I wanted them to do. So it was definitely, from my point of view, a, a useful activity. Um, so those are some uh, other papers, I think, certainly since I've seen um, H5P, I've been using it a number of years in a couple of different contexts, uh, but I've seen certainly since COVID uh, an explosion of um, uses for H5P and people using H5P. So those are a couple of papers that I picked out, maybe that you might like to have a look at yourselves if you just wanted to Google them. Um, and you can see in different settings as well where H5P is useful. So that's me done um what i'll do is i'll put the link to the h5p in the chat box and uh i can take questions maybe whenever they think it's appropriate okay thanks very much charlene um i suppose uh a question i'd have is like if if it's a lecturer from, from another college who let's say didn't have uh, access to moodle and, and and so on and so forth uh is h5p something that you can use um standalone let's say is it online that that lecturers can start using it so. is yeah there are two i suppose two different things first of all there's h5p.org and h5p.com so they obviously have a subscription service for uh people on h5p.com now i'm actually going to put this in here um so if you if you can see in the chat box um i'm going to put it in for everybody and hopefully you'll be able to see what it looks like on h5p.com but if you go to h5p.org you can actually set up a free account um test it out try it out yourselves and you don't have to be inside an lms um so you can see the drilling is open that there you don't have to be inside the lms to be able to use it uh, and it's quite straightforward if you use it here with h5p.org and they have loads of examples um for you to start with then Let's imagine your organization or that you, your institution takes on the H5P as a plugin for the LMS, for example, Moodle, um, make sure that you, you bring it over, you can import it. So, for example, if you see scroll down a little bit, Jordan, you can see that there's a reuse option on the one that I had there where I can download it and um, I can use it again somewhere else or I can upload it to another platform if it was within Moodle or something like that. So this is h5p.com. It's a free trial. I think it's a 30 day trial. But I, what I can do is I can try it out on this one and then I can actually bring my content over to h5p.org or into the LMS as well. Okay. A couple of comments there in, in VVox. Um, just saying, I suppose, around the, the usefulness of uh, checking who is engaged and see the benefit of, of student understanding. I suppose it gives you an opportunity to kind of pivot or, or change your approach in the following class where you can see where there might be a few gaps in people's understandings. Definitely. And for the flipped classroom approach, H5P with the interactions work really works really well because as you go into the class, you have sight of what they have done. 
Um, and you can see then, okay, as you say, maybe there are gaps in understanding or something like that as well. So, yeah. And definitely. a second question. Um, are there particular repositories you use to find existing videos? Um, uh, to be honest, I don't discriminate. <laughs> I'll start with YouTube and I look to see now, obviously there are kind of certain repositories or certain accounts like the Khan Academy where things are, you know, they're particularly good from the point of view of the academic context as well. But honestly, I'll just, I will just go onto YouTube and um, go through it myself. And we all have to do a certain amount of moderation when it comes to the content on YouTube as well. But I have in, in my discipline area, there are specific accounts where I know it's going to be really good. Uh, at this stage, and I kind of go back to them and go, okay, look at that's you know that's one that I will I will use because it touches all the things that I want to do. But I really do just couldn't go and look because you know yourselves, any of you who've created videos, it can take hours to create them. And unless you're looking at something specific like we had earlier this morning in the lab or something like that, particularly in my context where it's around technology and so on, it's just easier to go online and see what people have been doing. So uh, like I say, I don't discriminate. <laughs> Thanks very much, Geraldine. Thanks very much, Dave. Thanks, everyone. Next up, we have uh, Betty Brennan from TUS, Midlands Midwest. Um, so I'll invite Betty to share her screen. Thanks very much, Dave. And I'm just looking to see how I'm going to share my screen or where it is. I can't see my actual screen here. Sorry. Um, go here. So can everybody see that? OK, that's good. Sorry. So hello again. And Dave, thank you. Um, as you said, I'm Betty Brennan. I'm the Information and Data Compliance Officer in TUS Midlands. And um, I'm delighted to be here today and just to give an overview about data protection and also to show that data protection is not the bad guy. You know, we're not the bad guy here. This will be a change in tech. I think listening to everybody and all the excitement about videos and, and using videos and recording for self-assessment and for peer assessment and for lots of different reasons. And it's a really good thing to have. And data protection isn't about stopping people from doing it, but it's about just taking into consideration that there may be privacy issues around it and how to deal with those. Um, so we don't like, I'm not about stopping new initiatives. I love new initiatives, but I do think that it's important to just take these things into account. Um, this is probably going to be an information heavy session. So I'll fly through this and um, take the questions at the end if that's okay. So I'm going to go backwards on this. I'm going to identify all the issues that may be in place. I'm going to identify the data risks. I'm going to identify what personal data is. And then I'm going to say what we should be doing at the very beginning to prevent any risks. So I hope that makes sense to people. Um, so firstly, there's a presumption around online recording that you don't gather a huge amount of personal data. So you presume that you're going to get things like your name or your nickname or maybe an ID number. And of course, an image. Most times you have an image. But if you take into account why you might have a facial image, there are times you're going to have an image of the background. So people's backgrounds. I was in one particular session and I was uh, listening to the presenter. And behind the presenter was a bookshelf with all the books that they were reading and all the books that and they showed their, they may have showed their religious, their philosophical, they may have showed, showed health concerns. So we're collecting information that we don't expect, even just by visually looking at something, we're collecting information about people. And it's the same when it comes to your class discussion. So in class discussions, people can reveal things about themselves and they'll often do it, especially if they get comfortable. You know, you talk about how to make people comfortable to share information during a video session. But if people get comfortable, they can of, often share things that they don't necessarily mean to share. So they might share their philosophical beliefs or they may share information about health. And it's not something that they expect to be recorded, but the session is being recorded. And we often forget that the session has been recorded halfway through a session. Uh, so it's better to just take it into account and let people know in advance what they should be doing. And so really before doing anything, before collecting any information, you should look at the scope of what you may possibly be going to collect. And the wider you look at, the wider the scope you make, the lower you can make the risk for yourself. So now that we've kind of looked at the potential scope of what the personal data might be, I'm going to look at the principles of how that data can be processed. So I like to think of it like administering medicine. So if you're a doctor and you want to administer medicine, you're going to try and do it with as least as little harm as possible. So if you do it correctly, you're going to have a good result. But if you do it incorrectly, you're going to have a negative impact. So to avoid having a negative impact, what I like to do is these are the principles. And you, when you apply the principles and you think about them from a logical point of view, it actually works. So you apply them first. You have to do it lawfully, fairly and transparently. And even from listening to everybody, it was lovely to hear people that said thank you to somebody for giving me permission to share their video clips or other people just talking about how they made sure that people knew exactly what they were doing and what kind of processing was taking place. 
your purpose limitation. Why are you collecting the information? If you're collecting the information just solely for that class and for using it for that particular program and for assessment, then people need to know that's what you're doing. If you're going to be changing the purpose, they need to know about that as well. Data minimization. How much information do you need to collect and avoid collecting information that you don't need? And the accuracy. So for recordings, are you going in to amend any of the recordings? Are you going to look and say, well, actually, there was a big piece in the middle that I didn't need that wasn't useful. So I'm going to take that out so that the final recording that we present is not going to have that information in it. But in doing that, you have to make sure that that recording hasn't taken somebody's opinion about something and changed it, you know, so that you haven't cut it halfway through and suddenly somebody has got a completely different opinion on the other side of the recording than they had when the recording was made. Your storage limitation. Everybody was talking about storage. How much storage do you have? But how long are you going to keep the information? So where are you going to store it? And how long are you going to keep it? I was very interested in the YouTube part because YouTube is generally personal to the person themselves. You're going to put it up on your own personal YouTube account and you are going to make it private. But are you going to give somebody else access to that after the fact? So are you going to give a different class group access to that because the information there was just so good? but you're giving them access to something that somebody else's personal data is in as well. So while you're thinking about storage limitation, also think that it's very easy to reduce the limit of your storage by getting rid of what you don't need. Um, and also, I suppose, the integrity, the integrity that you use when collecting personal information and to make sure that you take into account the confidentiality aspect of things. Really, it's about our accountability because you're going to be trusted as education providers, you're going to be trusted by the students to take care of their information properly. And so it's very important that we know how to do that. And then data protection says we have to have a lawful basis. There has to be, this is one of my, and Geraldine and anybody who has been talking to me about personal data and about going forward, um, this is one of the first things that I ask, what's the reason? What's your lawful basis? Have you a lawful basis? If you don't have one that's laid down in law, then really that, data, it might not be possible to actually process the data. And usually when people think about a lawful basis, they think about consent. They say, there's the perfect lawful basis, consent of the individual, because if they say that I can do it, well, that's great. It means I can go ahead and do it. And that's kind of set in stone. Unfortunately, it isn't because consent has to be unambiguous. People have to know exactly what they're consenting to. And it has to be freely given and it has to be as easy to remove as it is to give. So for something like this, where you're trying to progress a, cl a class forward and you're trying to provide information and you're trying to get all the students involved, consent is really a very awkward basis to have because you're trying to collect consent from everybody. And all you need is one person that's going to say, I don't really want to do this. Um, but because the performance of a contract, so all students are involved in a contract as soon as they sign up with the HEI. And because we're trying to perform that contract by giving them the best possible options for different types of lectures, different types of assessments, I think that the performance of a contract is the strongest basis for doing this. Now, there is a proviso with that to make sure that when you are doing, looking to run the video from the point of view of a performance of a contract, you have to make sure that you know what the contract is. So therefore it has to be within the remit of the contract. So therefore to provide the information that students need to assess the students. And that's where it stops. It has to stop there. Um, and anything other than that then goes back into consent. So any other reason for sharing the info or for using the information will go into the consent of the individual. Or if you can anonymize everything, if you can take all the personal data out, then you can use it for whatever you want. So there were some videos there that didn't really have any personal information in them. You can use those for whatever you want. I highlighted in red just the lawful basis that I thought might apply in this instance. And in one of them, there's legitimate interest. So a lot of people say, well, look, at it's in our interest to have this information, to share this information and to collect this information. But public bodies aren't really supposed to do that because we are supposed to base everything on contract but also it's a bit of an odd one because it mightn't always it could be argued that it isn't necessarily in the interest of the business to do this or it isn't in the interest of the data subject and you have to look at the individual are their rights being overridden just because we want our rights to be put in place so i still think the performance of contract is probably your strongest on this um and Speaking of rights, we'll go and look at the data subjects rights. And I think this is the best place to start when you are looking to process information about people. So if you go back and say, well, what rights do I need to apply? 
before I collect the information. So the first thing is, and this is the most important one, the right to be informed. People need to know why you're collecting the information. So you think, why am I doing it? Give them as much information as possible. Tell them all the benefits. Tell them all the, all the benefits for themselves. If there's any positive or potential negative things, Tell them what the negatives might be. Tell them how you're going to try and address those negatives and tell them how securely you're going to keep the information. I'm listening about open data source information or open source information. Fantastic. However, open source has risks attached to it and everything like that should be looked at. So you should go to your data protection person in your college or your institute or your university to make sure that the open source platform that you're using is risk-free or as risk-free as possible. And if it isn't risk-free, how do you make it risk-free in order to use it? Um, students have rights to correct inaccurate data. Again, as I said, if, they, if you've amended the information and it looks like their opinion has been changed, how can you reverse that? Do you have to take that into account? And also they have the right to request a copy of their data. So they have the right to access the information. Now it looks like for the majority of what you're doing, they're going to have access to the information anyhow. So that isn't going to be an issue. But you might just look at that from the point of view of storage, retention, security. And if somebody says, I actually want a copy to keep of this information, you have to look at removing other people's personal data. So you also have to speak to the students themselves and say to them, look, these all apply to you. You have to take as much care of everybody else's personal information as I do. And so you can't record something on your phone. There are certain things you just can't do. So it's about providing as much information about what you're doing as possible. They have the right to be forgotten. And this is when this right came up in GDPR, so many people panicked about it because they were saying, well, people are going to be asking for everything to be deleted. But that really wasn't the case. Um, so they, how do you prevent this happening? You prevent it happening by making sure you use the contract as your lawful basis. The same with restricting further processing the contract. So all those things are doable, but they're doable at the end of your lawful basis, which is your contract. The rest, the, the ones I've highlighted in blue, wouldn't be something that you'd really be interested in or wouldn't really probably apply to what you're doing. Um, but I put them in there because it may be that at the end of all this process, you might end up finding yourself in the situation where you have to give somebody information that they're looking for to be to be provided. Am I coming close to the end of the time, Dave? You, you are, you are, Betty. Uh, Sorry, I'm a chatterbox. We, we can have another minute. We can have another minute. Okay, another minute. Okay, well, I'll fly through the minute. Um, Again, this is the important thing. I think I've more or less spoken to this privacy statement. It's about how you're collecting the information. Give them as much information as possible. Um, more importantly, how long do you need to keep the information? I know we're talking about keeping it. If you want to use it, if something looks like it's an exemplar of what you want this process to look like, and you think one class has done really well and you want to share it with everybody else, you really have to get consent from all the class to share that. Really, from a data protection point of view, that's what they're expecting. Um, so finally, uh, I'm going to fly through all this training. This is what I think is the most important thing. Make sure it's well explained to the participants. Are there guidelines for participants? Do they know what they're supposed to be doing? The do's and don'ts of, on, of um, taking part in an online participation session. Don't record the session on a device. Very important. A lot of students will do that, but they're collecting other people's information. Will it be a formative or summative process? I heard Geraldine speaking about that. So is it going to impact the participants' results? So what they're saying online, is that going to impact their results? And that needs to be explained to them as well. And again, could you want to use it for a different process? So to summarize, with sufficient preparation and consideration, the use of recordings for self and peer assessment can be carried out in a safe and lawful manner. And once you have put the correct protocols in place, they can be used for any similar project. And the good thing about that is when you get everything prepared in advance and you have everything in place, you can use it continuously and you don't have to reinvent the wheel, as Geraldine said. And thank you. I hope that was informative and not too fast. <laughs> Thanks, Dave. That's great. Thank you so much, Betty. Um, what we'll do is we'll hold questions now till after Michael, if, if you can stay on, Betty, and um, we'll uh, ask Michael uh, if he would like to take over the wheel. Okay, so hopefully everybody can see that. Uh, I'm just going to talk a, a bit about uh, open um, open education resources and repositories for videos. Uh, my name is Michael Donny. I'm the science librarian in Tusset Loan. So it's just a whistle stop tour of some resources. Uh, so the first one is the obvious one, YouTube. Uh, I, I put in some factoids there. 
because it's an amazing resource. Um, as you probably know, it started in 2005 when one of the founders uploaded uh, a video entitled Me at the Zoo. And in 10 years, it went up to a billion viewers. It now has 2.3 billion viewers and is the second most popular site on the whole of the internet right after Google. Um, it's um, 694,000 hours of videos are streamed on YouTube each minute. Uh, and there's more than 37 million YouTube channels. And, you know, a, a single YouTube channel can have thousands of videos. So uh, I, I've heard it estimated that there's 19 billion videos on YouTube, but uh, I couldn't see an official estimate. Uh, so this is some examples of educational channels on YouTube, which Geraldine mentioned. Um, and you can see TED Ed, Smarter, Fiance, App Science, National Geographic has 9,000. 739 videos and 19.6 million subscribers, but all of them have, have uh, you know, at least 7 million uh, of those. And there's many, many more. There are, some of them are very high quality. So these are all available to academics to use. Um, then what I did was I said, well, we'll just have a look and see what uh, colleges have on their uh, website. So these are all third level colleges and these are their video uh, open access collections. So you can see New School New York listed, Australia, ourselves in a clone, San Diego University, um, Zayed University uh, in the United Arab Emirates, St. Francis College, America and Central Washington. And what's, I suppose, what, what's common just looking at it is how many there are and how different a lot of them are. Uh, how many resources there are out there. Um, of those ones that I just showed you, there's a number that I repeated. So these would be popular OER sources for third level colleges, uh, OER Commons, TED Ed, Khan Academy, Vimo, British Panta, National Film Board of Canada, of Canada, Internet Archives, PSV, Nova, and just a few others I threw in there, um, Alison, RefSeq. Uh, there's a hundred, that's a link to a hundred educational video free educational video sites there if you're interested in checking out that. Uh, also, just a top tip if you're interested in setting up some uh, resources and looking for videos as well as YouTube and these, you could try doing a Google search for LibGuides and OER video. Geoset, another example of a high quality academic repository that's freely available. Uh, it's not um, it's, it's just particular videos, but it's well worth having a look to see is there something that you could use if you're an academic. Finally, um, at the top of the pile, of course, are the subscription video repositories. Um, Jove is the Journal of Video Experiments. And we're going to be having a look at this in more detail in a moment because we have a, a subscription to it in a clone. Um, academic videos online from ProQuest seems to be a huge uh, source of academic videos. It seems to be very popular in American universities. Um, and it also has a public library videos uh, version on the same portal. So these are all paid for versions through publishers, but they're, they're, they would be very, very good versions. Uh, Job is very popular in a clone uh, with the lecturers. Um, clinical skills then is an example of a subject specific uh, video repository from a major publisher. Again, it's paid for, and it dis in this case, it relates to uh, videos on clinical skills for nursing students. It's an interactive resource, primarily video based, although you wouldn't know that if you looked at it, it doesn't mention videos anywhere in the, in, in the spiel about it, but uh, that's what it is. So the second half of my presentation, we're going, I'm going to show you quickly uh, what Jove looks like in action, hopefully. So uh, this is uh, the Jove uh, interface. And uh, as you can see, it's divided into the research section and uh, which is the Jove journal uh, and the education section. And it's got various um, features that I'm going to quickly look at uh, all in about four minutes. And it's got a faculty resource. So I'm going to try going, going live uh, onto it and hopefully this will work. Uh, make sure I'm sharing my sound.
Okay, so so we're on live now uh, with Athlone's uh, version of it. As you can see, there's fourteen to over fourteen thousand videos, and um, if you uh, just want to search across everything, you can just type it in here. So uh, polymers change polymers change chain reaction. Excuse me. You can see that it divides it into research and education. Um, research area. We could just click on one. And you can see your video coming up here. You can always just click on the article and you'll see the original academic article that this is based on. So the all of the videos in the Jove journal are, are based on academic articles that are peer reviewed and are in PubMed and Web of Science. Um, so we'll just go back to the journal. And you can see under Jove Journal, you got a methods collection tab, which is lots of scientific methods, which is very interesting. Uh, the Jove Journal uh, of Scientific Experiments, uh, as well as being divided in by subject, um, it, it can also be just browsed by most recent and most popular. Also under research, you got Jove Encyclopedia of Experiments, which is a fantastic resource if you're interested in particular experiments in say cancer or biology. Um, the cancer uh, experiments one is divided into various subsections and there'd be about 20 uh, videos in each. Now, as well as the Jove, uh, the Jove journal, uh, there's a huge amount of resources specifically related to education. Uh, as you see, it's divided into seven areas and these are in Jove core, which is for undergraduates introductory. Uh, um, and um, if you go into Jove core, you can see uh, we're going to social psychology. It's arranged like a book and each chapter, say chapter two, the social self has about nine videos um, to support your teaching. So if we have a quick look at one of them. You can see some of the features here. Um, so you can embed this straight into your uh, learning resource. Uh, just click on embed and it'll give you an embed code that you can, you can pop into your Moodle. Uh, or whatever your learning resource is. Uh, and there's more information on doing that depending on your learning resource. Um, you can share the site on Facebook, etc. You can add to your favorites and add to a playlist. So as an academic, you can have a playlist uh, for specific groups of students. There's a transcript. And uh, also, if you if you play the concept of a social self can be played a video, you can control the speed and you can put in closed captioning. Uh, and you can very handy for assessment, create a quiz for your students. For every video, there's suggested questions and answers, but you can add your own, uh, et cetera. And then you just fill in a few fields here, create your quiz, and that will bring you to uh, this screen here, the quiz screen, and go to my quizzes. And you can distribute that to your students and look at the results, etc. So that's a very useful resource. The Joe Science Education is more advanced. It's for more, it's more aimed at postgraduate students, huge amount, to, and it's more live experiments. Some great experiments there online. Uh, huge amount of disciplines. The lab manual is uh, it, it's basically a video manual of laboratory experiments and it's very very useful for academics and you can see it's divided into instructor preparation so you, you can see what, what you need the concepts that are involved and the student protocol so very very useful um, finally just if you go to the faculty resource center here and you need to be signed on as an individual you can get videos mapped to your course. For instance, if I, if I go into biology, introduction to biology, there's hundreds of videos there. You could do the entire introduction course through videos. Um, you know, it's a fantastic resource. Uh, you can also map onto books, uh, onto particular textbooks here. And uh, you can, there's a lot more information of integration of Joe videos onto your LMS as well. Um, everything on Jove uh, you can't get anywhere else, so it's all pro it's and it's all very high quality. So I think I better stop there. Thanks very much, Michael. Um, You're welcome for that. And yeah, I've used Jove myself. It's fantastic, and so many different things outside of the video. It's it's so so great. Um, like a question I'd have uh, would be around the portals and the repositories for videos. I mean, we've so many lecturers who are making videos and so on at the moment. 
Yes. Are there any ones you see that, let's say, have, let's say, a bit of a peer review process or anything that you could almost submit your video to, um, uh, you know, as an academic? Anyone that's uh, popular? The, 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 uh, unfortunately, the paid ones are, I mean, as I say, uh, Job is peer reviewed. Um, the free ones, the quality varies. So, some of them I, I'm on YouTube are what they call teacher approved. Um, and um, GeoSet, you know, it, it depends on them. I, I don't know in my bit of research if there's any of them that guarantee everything on them is peer, peer uh, reviewed. Uh, um, well, it's a good good question, yeah. And uh, uh, a question there as well from Michael, uh, is Jove available for staff only? Um, well, students won't see your interface. So, you know, when I was showing you the protocols or creating quizzes, so you would have a, uh, so you have a staff interface and a student interface. The students do use it as a, as a video database and it's free, it's available on, on college logon, but they would have a different uh, interface than the staff. And then for Betty, a question there at the top. Um, should you get written consent if you want to share a video that a group of students have created? I could presume like a group presentation or a... a yeah. Well, in general, you should, because, you know, if you're to take it a number of years ago, there was a case, uh, a Novak won a case in relation to his exam script. And his exam script was then determined to be personal data. So if you're just to continue on with that same stream of thought, if a video is created by somebody, it is their own personal data. So you would really have to get consent to share it. Um, absolutely. So like, let's say if you want to show an example from uh, a previous year, you'd really need to get written consent from probably all the people in that group video will say that group presentation. Well, I think this actually goes to preparation in advance. If you say in advance to the students, you know, if, if I find something really good here, have you any issue with my using it? And if they all say yes at that point, you don't have to go and collect consent again the second time around, really, if you're using it. Once they've said, yeah, they're happy to use it, unless someone comes back to you and says, I'm, I'm removing that consent, you should be absolutely fine to use it. You know, I'd be thinking about it. You probably wouldn't be using it more than one or two years down the line. But um, yeah, they shouldn't be. I Advanced preparation, really, is the best way. And uh, another question that was there was like, did you, let's say, from your experience in your role, have you seen any like really good practice from, let's say, a lecturer who's who's doing, let's say, a video type assessment, who uh, maybe has done some of those things? Do you have any nice examples of, of that? Or well, I don't. There aren't that many lecturers that contact me with the videos that they've been doing. <laughs> I think they try and avoid me most of the time. <laughs> but I know that there are some that have contacted me in relation to how will I prepare to do this. Um, and that's one of my favorite questions because it's like putting boundaries in place and boundaries are not all, you know, people kind of worry about them sometimes, but they're a good thing to have when people know exactly what they're supposed to do and exactly what's happening to their information. I think that's really best practice. I think worst practice would be the opposite. Worst practice would be let's all just fire ahead and not take anything into account and then find yourself in a situation where somebody is hurt or upset or sending an email saying, you know, this happened to me and complaining, that's the, the worst, worst practice causes that or bad practice causes that. Okay, um, I think that's the questions from uh, VVOX. Um, so look, I'd like to thank all three presenters um, for uh, your presentations. Uh, they were so varied and they kind of all kind of connected together, which, which was really interesting. And um, we will move on to our next session now, uh, who, and the chair of that session is uh, Dr. Paul Liston. So I'll hand over to Paul and uh, thanks again.